I'm here to talk to you guys about authorization, but about authorization beyond what you can do with roles allowed. To do that, we need to investigate what authorization is. And we'll start with the basic question that authorization is supposed to answer. Who gets access to what? Sounds very simple, right? And if it were, we'd be done. It would have been time for lunch. Unfortunately, it never is. We're software developers. Things are never quite as simple as you might like. Um, the first bit is who gets access? Um, classically, those are the identification and authentication problems. Identification is an interesting one. This is a bit of marketing material that we put out late in the 1970s. Look at the belt of the woman in the picture. That is an identification device, otherwise known as an electronic key. These days, those look different. It's these. Back in the day, there was no authentication. It was just identification. Is that actually necessary, though? Well, one of our customers, Schiphol Airport, I've taken the liberty to clip this from their security handbook, actually does authorization of people disembarking planes without identifying them. So if you land at Schiphol Airport and the plane is from an EU country or a screen country, you get a different flow of through the airport depending on exactly the plane. You get authorized, for instance, if you're from an EU flying from an EU country, to enter the country un uh, unblocked. So you don't actually need identification as such for granting authorization. This is another example of where you don't actually need stuff that you might think you need. And that's on the authentication side. So these are gates towards a company parking lot. See those cameras? Those ANPR cameras, actually all they need is your license plate number. They recognize the license plate number and give you access. Anybody could copy that license plate. Anybody could come up with a particular license plate to the camera and get access to the company parking lot. It's an unauthenticated identification. Authentication is just one of the possible inputs to the authorization question. So, who gets access? Well, we don't actually need to know exactly. We don't actually need to know that it's exactly true, but we need to take it into account. So every authorization decision always takes into account who you're looking at, even in the case you don't actually precisely know. There's something that you know and that you need to take into account. Um, the other bit of the basic authorization question is access to what? And that's a tricky one to answer. In the physical world, it's quite simple. It's buildings, it's areas, it's 
doors. It's, well, is it though? Um, we grant access to locks, basically. We grant access to open doors. We do not grant access to buildings. We do not grant access to areas. We do not grant access to particular um, cabinets or machines. It's just a particular door at a particular side. That is enough to actually authorize people well enough to know whether they're supposed to be in there. Now, in general, that's not true, because if you have a standard door, it can be kept open. So you're authorizing people to go in, or let people in, or let people walk out. So you need to be quite precise as to what you're authorizing. Um, in the digital realm, that's different, though. In the digital realm, you can authorize reading a file. You can authorize creating a file. You can authorize calling a particular method. You can authorize reading fields. But you need to be very clear as to what you're authorizing. Because if you do not define that well, there will be unexpected authorizations in your system. There will be discussions. There will be hackers trying to find their way in. Um, the problem here is that authorization very much relies on your domain. So there is no real general way of dealing with it. You have to take into account what you're doing within your domain. You have to be um, clear as to the security properties required within your domain. One of the things that is often used in authorization decision is permissions. I give you permission to read the file. I give you permission to... This is generally a form of discretionary access control. Because if you have the permission, maybe you can hand out, out to someone else. Uh, that's generally what is used in Unix for file access. Um, but a permission is not an authorization. A permission might be driving down a particular road in a car. Should you have an authorization to drive the car, that should be possible, right? Not so much. If you actually have had one beer too many, suddenly you're no longer permitted to drive the car, even though you're authorized to do so. so suppose you drive a car and you think, hmm, that looks like a good shortcut. Why is that road red? It's a bike lane. Are you permitted to drive your car on the bike lane, even though you're authorized to drive cars on public roads? No, you're not. So permission is not the exactly same thing as authorization. You have to take into account the difference. It's quite like the difference between classes and instances. Of course, permission is used in a different way as well. Um, if you look at uh, a particular system, generally a permission is you can access a particular client's data. You can access your bank account data. Um, we like to differ, uh, differ there. We like to use that word, uh, that that concept differently. And the word we uh, I like to use is 
an action or an activity or a right to be granted. Not a permission. A permission is the actual permission that is the instance of the authorization you've been given. Now that's all well and good, but we still don't know how to actually do any authorization. We know what the problem is. We know that, hmm, let's put it like this, we need to investigate how to do authorization. But how do we actually do the, the decide? How do we build a system that does that for us? Because I don't want to do it by hand. There's loads and loads and loads of methods of doing access control or authorization. Um, this is just a few over the past decades. The only thing that I know it's based and confusing as hack. Um, of course, they all have expansions. The back is always based access control. Attribute based, context based, graph based, lattice. What the hell is all this? Uh, let's not go there yet. Um, I know I need to authorize things. I know that I can grant and revoke access. And, uh, there's probably been people that have been deeper into this than I have. Let's look further. And then there's... Oh, oh that was a bit too far, was it? Yeah. I think it was. No, I, I, I skipped the slide. Uh, the one thing that is in Java is role-based. So one of this slide just now is in Java. This is where roles allowed comes in. Of course, uh, it's not actually defined where the attribute is defined. Uh, the Java EE defines it as the group membership of a principal in a realm. And that's just the default. Uh, let's get back to the original question, right? Um, who gets access to what? The who is the principal. A principal gets access to whatever we're trying to block with rules allowed. The principal has to have group membership. How that's done, uh, doesn't say. That's up to the application container. Um, group membership implies a role of the same name. Uh, okay, wouldn't have chosen that, but fine. And there's something called a realm that's identified, but also up to the application container. And then there's roles reference. What, what, what's that about? It's I haven't seen it used. Um, it's supposed to define the groups, but how would that work in a large organization with lots of groups? Eh. Nah, this 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 doesn't help me. Something else does. XACML. <laughs> Sorry. Cough. Uh, XACML. The extensible access control modeling language. Uh, an Oasis standard. It's been around for two decades, roughly. Based on XML, it's policy based access control. It's a really ugly beast of a thing. I'd ex advise you not to do XACML if you can help it. But 
there's one redeeming quality. And that's this architectural view. Because what XAML provides you is clarity on how to do authorization within your system. As I've just stated, what authorizations are is very domain dependent. How to manage them is very domain dependent. It may actually be company dependent. How to enforce them, how to deal with them, can be generalized. Um, let's go into this for a bit. There's four main components to the architecture. The PIP, the PAP, the PAP, the PDP. I like to think of them as quick, quick and quack and their computer. Um, and they all work together to do authorization. Let's start out with the policy enforcement point. In the physical world, this is a policy enforcement point. This is a set of tourniquets and they have the useful property that they're one way, generally, at least when you present your badge on one side, you're not going through in the other direction. Um, they are single person, so when you go through them, you, well, you know that probably only a single person has gone through. So this is very useful way of enforcing access. This is a policy enforcement point. A door is a policy enforcement point. A barrier, one of those moving barriers, is a policy enforcement point. Rolls allowed is a policy enforcement point. Huh. Now we get to something that I can reason about. The Java E spec is under specified. There may well be implementations of the um, Java authorization uh, container. Um, what's it called again? I forget. Uh, it's always on the top of my mind. It's Jack is JSR. 115, so it's even older than rolls allowed. But um, yeah, see, I always forget what it's for. Um, but it's the authorization uh, API for containers. Uh, rolls allowed hooks into that. Uh, but you have to know that it's a policy enforcement point to know how it ho hooks into that. Jack only executes the policy. Uh, permit all is obviously a policy enforcement point for a very simple policy, as is deny all. Uh, if they're, whether or not they're useful to you, I don't know, but they're there. Another policy for enforcement point is just a simple if then else. If you have some way of checking a policy, you can just conditionally choose what path to take in your code. Um, Spring Security has a couple of nice ones. Pre-authorized post filter. Uh, they're extremely useful in web, uh, in a web sense. Somewhat less useful when you're actually authorizing methods. Um, but in a web sense, pre-authorize allows you to cut off access entirely. Binary decisions. Post-filter is a bit smarter than that. It might allow you to actually have non-binary decisions. So yeah, you get to access the document of that client. Yeah, you get to access the patient's data, but not the particular medical records if you're just in the administrative office. That was quack. Uh, Pep. They need some way of deciding whether or not something is allowed. That's the policy decision point. 
Now, this is where the actual logic to determine whether or not access is allowed takes place. Generally, you don't want to put this all over your code. However, you want it to be fast because you want to authorize generally everything in your entire system. So you're down to on the order of 10 millisecond time limits to do this decision. We'll come back to that limit later a bit. Um, but you can do anything here. Now that's nice. This is where I can put my code. I love that. Um, it's just that my code is written somewhere. Because my code enforces the policy, uh, decides on the policy. So the code is the policy. And generally there's people with meanings, uh, with, uh, with um, uh, opinions about what it should be. Strong opinions. Some of them are lawmakers. The code that I'm writing is, in XML terms, the policy administration point. And if I do it smart, I'll have some DSL to administer the policy and some DSL that actually I can use to communicate with the people with opinions on these particular um, policies. Um, this is the main reason of existing for XACML, because XACML basically defines one such possible policy language. It's XML. I don't like XML, I don't know if you do, but that's not even the major problem with it. It's very flexible, it's hard to read, and it's hard to communicate and reason about with the opinion makers, the people that actually have to decide on the policy. Code also is. So if you're going to do policy decision, you really better be able to explain your code. This decides, in the end, what the decisions are. This decides who gets access where? So it needs to be kind of, well, very secure doesn't cut it. This is at the core of the security of your system. Uh, it may need auditing. I know that many banks don't like to have uh, just anybody walk into them or anybody having granted access to their vaults or, as the case is today, their data centers. So any changes to the actual policy, do maintenance, does maintenance personnel get access? And how? And when? And why? Any changes to the policy may need auditing. Um, you can probably see why this then needs to be outside of the inner loop. The decision needs to be made quickly. You have like 10 milliseconds. But if you need to audit it, I'd better do it on the policy and make sure the policy doesn't allow stuff you don't want in your authorization system. And let's go back to the Schiphol example I just stated. The people on an airplane are allowed by law to enter the country, if they're from the EU. So the policy had damn well better allow that. Of course, there's a few caveats to that, but the basic principle is part of the policy is law as written. Well, I definitely don't want lawmakers to be in my inner loop. We've, lacked, we've missed one last aspect 
of this architecture. And that's the policy information point. And that might actually be the most important bit of the entire architecture. Because that is where you actually make the policies maintainable, describable. At the policy information point, if we go back to the example of Schiphol, um, from the policy information point you get the information required to make the actual policy decision. So the policy states, if the plane has come from an EU country, people get to enter the country without going through customs, without going to screening. How do we know? What plane is being disembarked? We know from the arrivals database. We know from the plane to gate assignment database. So, from the gate assignment database, we can get what state the policy enforcement point, being the doors in this case, need to be in. What the elevators need to allow for entrance and exits. Now, it's not quite as simple as that, because somebody needs to confirm that the information is correct in the case of Schiphol. But the gate assignment database is part of the authorization decision. The information there is part of what we're looking at. Um, other information they can use is, for instance, the current time. That's annoying, isn't it? I don't want to have local time in my system. I don't want to get local time. I want to have a clock that I can... But I still need it. So I'd better be prepared for it. I don't want people to enter my building at midnight, preferably. Especially not visitors and contractors. Employees, maybe. Even then, not so much. Um, in other examples, the information that you might need is what class a teacher teaches, or what patient a doctor sees, or what account belongs to a particular pe a person logged in. As I've just stated, this architecture actually really helps me think through what I'm doing and how to do it. And I need to be very secure in this. Now, in the Schiphol example, confirming the data from the policy information point is a requirement because we're not sure that it's always correct. We cannot be sure that it's always correct. Looking at the um, integrity bit of the CIA triad, somebody might have entered the wrong gate number, or the pilot might have been taxied to the wrong gate. But it's still part of the security of my building, so I need to confirm that the data is right. Um, the policies need to be well maintained, well uh, kept well in hand. This is where supply chain management comes in. This is where auditing access to the metadata comes in. This is where governance comes in. Do we actually make the policies right? Do we actually inspect our authorization policies? Are we doing something that is applicable to the system that we are authorizing for. Now, Rolls Aloud has a problem there. Because it's underspecified, you get to not really do governance on it. 
you can only say something about it if you also know the actual particular implementations of the policy providers that Jack uh, specifies. If you know the actual application runtime that you're deploying on and whether it... So you need to be need a lot more than just checking whether the roles allowed annotations are at the right spots in your system. Um, let's see now. Given that problem of governance, we might go back again to our authorization models because they can inform us what to actually do. Because it may well be that roles are enough in the particular context we're in. It may well be that the context we're in, the group membership doesn't change all that much. The policy can just take into account that fact and we might be done. Of course. It may also be that we need something more. We may need attributes such as has the um, principle authenticated through multi-factor authentication. So you can get access to a patient's address maybe without multi-factor authentication, but not to the medical records because those are more sensitive. Once again, non-binary. Um, you might need the context that you're in. It's nice that you want to pay with your credit card in Kuala Lumpur. But yesterday you were in the Netherlands and there's no flight bought from that credit card. Maybe we want to look into that, right? So you want to authorize that payment eh, with some more criticism. That's the context bit. The others I won't go into. It's, you can look for, uh, for it yourself, but they are mind sharpeners. They do help um, reasoning about authorization within the context that you're authorizing in. They help reasoning about what security properties do I want to make true and what properties do I need from my authorization system to actually make those properties to you. And I just like lattice based is interesting. The idea in lattice based author access control is that all subjects and objects in your system, all principles, all who's, and all what's get a security level. And if a subject wants to access a particular object, the level of the subject needs to be above the level of the object to be accessed. Now you can combine this and you can com make a complete uh, mathematical lattice um, where you deal with lower bounds and upper bounds of the uh, uh, complete uh, mathematical lattice if you have multiple subjects and multiple objects. This may seem far-fetched, but it's not. Um, for instance, if you need a guard to guide you through a building to a particular uh, room in which you can have a conversation. Now you need to have the access of both the guard and the one that's being guarded Anyway, this helps reasoning about authorization. Let's go deeper into some examples. 
because this has all very, been very abstract. This has all been hand wavy. I've literally waved my hands at you. Um, assume we're in a educational software setting. Assume we have teachers teaching classes. I really, really, really like for those teachers to be able to update the grades of those classes. Now assume we also have students in that same system. I really, really, really want the students to read the grades, not edit them. But I don't want students to see others' grades, and I don't want to see, see teachers grading students not in their classes. So, what do I do? What did, huh? Their classes? Huh. There's something here. Ah. Their classes is a abstract concept that I need to relate back to the information in my system. Because I have somewhere an administration of what teacher teaches what class. I have somewhere already information needed to do this decision. Why not use it? Now, with that rules allowed, I'd actually not be able to, because there's no way in the arguments to put the precise class. So that's a bit of an annoyance. Um, for something that seems very, very wanted. Furthermore, the my own class, as an abstract concept, needs to have some type of embodiment. But it's different for every teacher. That's yet another point where I need to introduce indirection. I need to interpret the abstract concept a teacher gets to grade, uh, to added grades in their, uh, for to students in their own class, I need to interpret their own class in the actual concrete instance of the data set that I have. So the actual permission may well be, teacher gets to edit Sanders grades, teacher gets to edit Eric's grades, teacher gets to edit Martijn's grades. That's the permission that I want granted. And I want it at the level of the grade of a particular student, because that's generally how I model this. A student has grades, right? Because the student wants access to their own grades, not the entire class. That's interesting. I need to interpret. Let's make it more complex example, healthcare. Now the educational example is born out of practice, but it's a previous job. Healthcare we still do. Home care nurses helping patients need access to the medical data of that patient. Need to know what has, uh, what problems the patient has, what needs to be done, what the history is. But you don't want them to access the data willy-nilly. You want to them to access the data only when necessary. Because medical data, and now we get back to law again, is under the GB GDPR and under a highly restricted category of data in the GDPR. In the healthcare information system, it's, it's the point of the system to put it in, right? So what we've devised is a way of giving um, nurses access to the healthcare records of patients that they're scheduled to see, that they're planned to help. Once again, this is an interpreted right. The right is for the 
patient that you're scheduled to help. The permission is an interpretation of that right within the context of the system where I take into account the nurse's schedule, where I take into account the patient, and where I take into account the problem that a nurse may have been called in to a particular patient and needs access now. So the nurse has a button, give me access. That's only possible within the access that the nurse should have to do their job. For instance, I don't want that nurse to edit the patient's address. That's with the administrative functions. So the give me access is something that is still within the rights that the nurse generally has, but within a different patient scope. And that button takes into account the original rights, and has an extra, uh, extra audit rule on top of it because you really don't want to give people access willy-nilly. But you cannot actually do the authorization in advance. You need to have something in place to do the authorization at the point of need. You need to have an exception to the policy. Uh, that's annoying, but we can do that. Rolls out won't do you good there. We can still do that. We can build that into the system. I have just a little bit of time left. I've just spoken about the problems and the what we actually want to achieve. How do we implement this? And now I have one or two slides with actual code, and then I'm just going to talk. This actually is how we implement access within our physical access management system. I hope you can read at least the top line and the bottom line. This is the if then else. Right? So the actual implementation, the actual policy enforcement is as simple as an if then else in the right spot. Nothing more, nothing less. However, we already see that we have an authorization granted result. So there's already been a calculation to decide. Right? We have already done something to see whether to grant access or not. And if we grant access, we have to do a lot of things. And doors are annoyingly asynchronous, especially if it's not a door but a long gate that has to go open and you have to wait for it before you can get in with the car and then it has to close again. And maybe it doesn't open quite as much if you're not with a car but only you as a person, right? So there's all kinds of things we have to do when granting access. But the actual policy enforcement is right at the top. That's where the, actu uh, the authori uh, authorization is actually enforced. That's where you know that you're doing either this or that. Um, that was the last bit I've, of code that I'm allowed to show you guys because this is all internal code. Uh, and this is safe enough. Uh, as I stated, this is all very security sensitive, so I'm not going to say too much. Um, but doing it like this is unwieldy. Is 
let's say, annoying to maintain. Really what you want, and it's not always possible, but what you want is to have this as an aspect, as a cross-cutting concern. Um, so in the healthcare domain, what we do is we've written our own spring um, policy providers for pre-authorized and post-filter that actually integrate with a custom backend that does the decisions for us. This is a separate deciding service that does the policy decisions. It has its own database of the subjects and the objects that are present in the system. Now this implies quite a bit, right? Its own database, the subjects and the objects in the system. All other services have to cooperate with this authorization server. They have to inform the authorization server of the subjects and objects present. Generally, mostly objects, but also relations of the subject to those objects. Um, it also implies that the authorization service has its own read model of the authorizable bits in your domain. Furthermore, I've just stated, we need to interpret rights. We need the ability to look at a patient that I'm planned to visit, for a home nurse case, and see what patient that actually is, and what the actual permission to the actual object is. And there's specific code to resolve that abstract right within the database that the authorization service has. And then we need to do it quick. You know, again, I said mm, about 10 milliseconds for a web case, that's true. Uh, I'm not talking about other cases. Um, there's concerns on where to run this service. Now, we generally deploy in our own clusters, and they're uh, in data centers that we know, and they have network connections that we know. But even then, there's latency spikes. Even then, there's things that we have to take into account. So what we do is we actually replicate the read model. Fortunately, we've designed it to be a read model. We replicate it to the different sites that our clusters run into. And we make sure, we make damn sure that we, calc we uh, calculate our decisions quickly. And that's through having a very simple model, a very simple set of, a very simple database, slightly denormalized, nice tricks. Now, this might seem like a good idea, but this is internal code, so you can't use it. Um, i just gotten a warning that it's about time for lunch, so I'm going to wrap up. The nice thing is that these ideas were not, also, not just put into practice in our company. There's this little company, Google, you might have heard of that has a lot more PhDs to throw at a problem, and around about the same time that we built our internal stuff with custom code and the like, they went a bit further, and they published the Zanzibar paper, which people have taken and turned into SpiceDB. I hope, with this talk, to have given you enough information to actually know what to look for when you want to do something like this. To know what you will, you might run into. And to know that, I know, I'll use SpiceDB. Google does that. Nobody ever got fired for buying uh, Google, not IBM. Um, yeah, be aware that that's just part of the answer. 
There's lots more that you have to take into account. And there's at least some ways of thinking it that I hope that have landed with you. With that, I would say thank you for listening. I hope it was informative. And I would like if any of you have any questions, come up to me and ask them. Thanks. <laughs>